Hi, everyone, and welcome to this session, which is uh, entitled Privacy Preserving Vertically Distributed Machine Learning. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining this, uh, this conference and uh, joining the pre-con uh, privacy conference uh, organized by OpenMind. So today we have uh, two amazing people, uh, Robin and Pavlos, who are from Aferis AI. Uh, so Pavlov is the co-founder and the CEO of FRS AI. Robin is the co-founder, uh, a company that uh, uh, FRS AI is a company that empowers large enterprise customers that to collaborate and analyze data securely without compromising privacy. Robin has studied medicine, philosophy, and mathematics, has been trained in global banking, and is a successful serial entrepreneur. And alongside Robin, we have Pavlos, who is a PhD student at Edinburgh Napier University and a researcher at the Open Mind. And he's also at Ethers AI. So Pavlos is currently a PhD student and in privacy preserving system around trust and identity, uh, identity at Edinburgh Napier University. Pavlos is also a researcher as Ethers AI and a member of Open Mind Security an identity team. His research interests include cybersecurity, distributed ledger technology, and privacy preserving machine learning. Thank you both for joining. Thank you so much. Um, great to be Thank here. Um, really exciting session. And um, we love to give you an overview today about a topic that is, um, I think, at the heart of the entire community and um, for us as a company as well, which is how to analyze vertically distributed data in a privacy preserving manner. And um, we'll start high level, give some introductions on, let's say, core terms. Um, so regardless of, let's say, what pre-existing knowledge you bring to the table, um, you should be able to follow and get something out of it. And we end with a more concrete application and implementation that we have developed open source and open mind. Um, Pavlis will give a deep dive on that and we'll show you, let's say, code the repo and such that those people that are really interested in what's actually happening there and not just why is this topic relevant as well um, get a solid understanding. So that's the plan for the day. And I'll be starting with giving an overview. And um, I hope you can now see my screen. Pablos, can you quickly confirm? Yeah. Yes. Wonderful. Um, so as mentioned, uh, the topic today, um, privacy preserving vertically distributed uh, machine learning, and we'll uh, give you in a second an insight into, first of all, what is this? But before that, um, I want to spend two minutes on uh, quickly saying some words about Aferis. Um, this is not a, let's say, session about Aferis. This is really a session um, that is only intended to create value for you. So this is really the just the first two minutes such that you can better assess of um, who are we from Aferis and what are we doing. So um, as Emil mentioned, our mission is to empower organizations to collaborate on data and um, build data-driven business models. And we do that by um, yeah, leveraging uh, technologies that enable to, on the one hand, protect the intellectual property of the data of the different organizations, and on the other hand, as well, protect the privacy or preserve the privacy and thereby enable such collaborative efforts. And as such, um, our mission from Aferis is really uh, very much aligned to that of Open Mind. Um, and we really think ourselves as the company that as well brings those technologies into implementation with um, large customers. And um, so, yeah, big partner of uh, Open Mind, big fan, um, friends with Andrew. So, um, yeah, very, very good uh, collaboration here. And as such, excited to be presenting this topic. And what we want to do today is as well give you an insight both what, let's say, new technologies and new advancements are there that push um, yeah, new, let's say, types of uh, federated machine learning or as well federated analytics. But on the other hand, as well, give some insights on why this is relevant for the market, what companies can actually start doing with that, and why. Um, the entire technologies that we are developing here together um, are really transformative um, for any data-driven industry. Um, yeah, so that's the goal for the day. And with that, I would kick it off and um, jump into the presentation and we'll make sure that there's room for Q&A um, at, yeah, at, uh, at the end of the session. So I'm free for you to write us any questions that you have. We start high level. What is federated learning? I think everyone in this room probably knows it. It's a technique to distribute model training 
such that data can stay decentralized. And as such, it opens up really new ways to collaborate on data because different participants in a data ecosystem can keep their data and um, nevertheless train joint models. And um, I think um, the, the idea of federated learning um, has, yeah, or the, the idea of federated computation. So the idea that you bring algorithms to the data rather than collect the data at a central um, server is, um, yeah, has changed a lot how we compute, how engineering is uh, being done in the last years. And um, yeah, and as such, I think the, the typical example that we often see is the one of mobile phones, where you have a central model and you send this model to different mobile phones where there's personal data, and then you train each model on those um, mobile phones and then send the trained models back to a central server, compute their some kind of new global model, and you iterate. And the benefits of this whole framework is that Obviously, identity and privacy of the different participants can be preserved. Um, and we see as well that there's more and more research being done that the performance of such federated learning uh, techniques really uh, are often similar to one where you would have the data all at one central instance. Now, and I think this as well is probably known to everyone in the room, um, is that the initial idea of federated learning, the initial idea of federated averaging is quite simple. So as mentioned, you start with a, a central, a, a global model, an untrained machine learning model, and you send it to different clients that each have one smaller data set that is relevant for the training. Then one, or you somehow train, you get upgraded um, or better uh, gradients. You, have, you learn something about this local data and then each of the different clients sent this locally updated model back. And then you just average these uh, different uh, weights and you end up with a new global model and then you iterate. That has been um, the first example of federated learning. And um, I think this idea of federated computations here is obvious and um, in itself very powerful, but it comes with lots of, um, let's say, yeah, difficulties because you, in this example, which is the horizontal federated learning, so um, where you have data, where you have one um, global model and that global model needs to learn on each different client side, that means that at each client, you somehow need the same features available on those you can train. And um, that is sometimes the case where you have, for example, organizations that really capture the same type of data, but they have different samples, different entities, could be different patients. For example, hospitals have different patients, but they always capture the same features. That's horizontal federated, that's a use case for horizontal federated learning. The first and let's say most obvious case and from a algorithmic perspective, the most easiest, but there's more to it. And I think this whole community is now really pushing into um, expanding how federated data and as well different distributions of that data can be analyzed. And um, the next uh, that we want to present today and as well talk about today is what happens when the data is not horizontally distributed, but vertically distributed. And we'll show as well what that precisely means. But here you can already see it. It's vertically distributed, vertically distributed data is data where you have different features for the same entities or for the same samples. So that means one person, for example, has different features uh, at two different places. And if you think about the idea of data ecosystems and the market relevance for that, then now suddenly this whole idea of federated computations really get transformative because you bring different modalities together such that they can be evaluated and as such new, entirely new collaboration opportunities arise. So it's not just you get more data and therefore let's say more precise models that generalize better, but suddenly you can really train different models because you can capture information along the value chain of a patient, of a customer, of, a, um, yeah, of something that you produce in material sciences. Um, so uh, that's what we would call vertically federated learning. Then there's as well the idea of just for the sake of completeness as, the, as well the idea of transfer learning where you 
train a model on one data set and then you use that knowledge to bring this knowledge, transfer it into a second data set, predict, for example, a um, new label uh, on, in the second data set and um, yeah, as such as well, federate the, the, the knowledge exchange. And then last but not least is split learning that, um, which is rather a methodology to split up the training of a neural network. And what we are showing you today is a way, a methodology to do vertically distributed data with as well split learning as an, as an application, but split learning in itself is first of all, just a methodology, how you can, um, yeah, let's say, uh, federate a model training. And the idea here is that on each data set, you train an own neural network which is then in the end only let's say one component of the entire neural network so that's a self-contained network that you train on one data set and then you only send the output of this um or, or the, pretty much the last layer um the cut layer to the next data set if that went too quick we'll as well explain that in detail um because this is let's say one of the applications that we show today so that's an overview of different let's say federated uh, machine learning techniques. And these are really relevant because they extend the way of how companies can start collaborate with each other. And so that's what we are seeing really uh, in the market that from a, let's say three years ago, where it's mostly focused on horizontal federated learning, companies, institutions, organizations are really opening up to new ways of thinking about uh, collaborations and as such now as well, extending their ways of um, thinking about different data modalities that sit in different companies or in different places and how they can be taken in uh, to yeah, extend uh, or unlock the full value of own data sets. Um, so last um, slide on federated learning um, in general, that let's quickly look at applicability. So to sum up, I would say federated learning is from a methodological point of view, really mature. But on the engineering side, there's a lot happening. Um, and obviously on the research and algorithmic side as well, but um, really on the engineering side, obviously this whole concept comes with constraints in particular, if you let's say push this federation up to the edge. And um, so in the end, um, federated learn is applicable if really the model training can be distributed and the local devices have sufficient computation and bandwidth capacity. And I think in the example of mobile phones, it's obvious that we are not there yet that simply from an engineering perspective, um, we can, let's say, fully leverage the value on the, uh, yeah, on the local mobile phone. But one has as well to say we are getting there and um, in particular Open Mind um, is doing a lot there. We as well, the use case partner for federated learning on mobile um, for Open Mind. So um, I think on that side, even on the engineering side, lots of exciting things are happening. Um, but that should always be kept in mind. Federated learning should not just be tested for applic applicability with respect to, let's say, algorithmic techniques and data sets available but really as well of what's the, um, yeah, what's the engineering side, where's data stored, do I have enough bandwidth and um, yeah, enough, uh, enough compute to really uh, run my training in a federated setting. Now let's go a step deeper and start uh, leave, let's say federated learning as an overview and look at a concrete use case that um, we want to address today and that is federated learning for vertically distributed data. And let's start by what is first of all vertically distributed data. So we've prepared here a table, a data set. And um, now if that is our, let's say, um, centralized data set, how can we now start partitioning that? And um, the typical thing when we talked about horizontal federated learning, horizontal partitions is where you really have just the, diff the same set of features at each place, but you have just more samples. Um, and so as such, you increase the sample size, but from the modality, so from the set of features, you do not change anything. That's horizontal partitions. Vertical partitions on the other side are, is data where you have some kind of way to know how the data sets uh, belong to each other. So here, customer ID in that case is present in, um, in, in the distribution, but 
Then on the other side, the features are different. So here on the left, you have the first name and the last name, and on the right, you have the favorite color. And that's the uh, distribution when we talk about vertically distributed data set. And as mentioned in the markets, in industries, as companies have different business models to acquire data, often we see vertical distributions across different companies in the same industry or in different industries. We often see vertical distributions. And so how to analyze this in a privacy preserving manner is a big question. And um, let's say from a production perspective, not a solved task yet. Now, what is Pi Vertical? Pi Vertical is a framework um, for vertically distributed data. And we've started with, let's say, uh, for vertically distributed data and um, federated machine learning. So obviously, if you talk about uh, queries or so, uh, anything else, there are different frameworks to analyze uh, vertically distributed data. But when it comes to federated machine learning, Pi Vertical here is a framework for vertically distributed federated uh, machine learning. And that's composed out of two steps. The first is what we call private set intersection. And the second is then the real federated uh, training, which is in our example, a split neural network. Now, private set intersection is, um, and I'll quickly explain what that is, but in general, when you talk about vertically distributed federated learning, you typically have a two-step approach. And that's the first, link those records in a privacy preserving manner. For us, private set intersection here is the go-to tool for the, let's say, use case and example we've used. Um, and then second of all, after you've linked the records, train in a federated setting, and we do that via a split neural network. Let's quickly look in, um, into those technologies uh, deeper. So let's start by private set intersection. Now, private set intersection um, is a technology that allows you to compute the intersection of two data sets in a privacy, privacy preserving manner. So it pretty much, it is what it states, private set intersection. What's the intersection of a data set and compute that in a privacy preserving manner. So to make that um, yeah, really graspable, Alice and Bob have some elements in their data and they share some, but others are different. And what we want to end up with is where, Bob, where Alice has an idea about Bob's data, but only those data points that Alice has as well in uh, her data set and the same um, for Bob. So Bob knows about Alice's data set, but only about those elements that are contained in his data set and the other elements are um, private. Um, so that's private set intersection. Um, as a general technology, there are cryptographic techniques, various different ones. So you can compute that in a homomorphically encrypted manner with SMPC, with classical cryptographic, um, so public key, um, uh, yeah, public-private key uh, cryptographic techniques. Um, we have developed together with OpenMind the private set intersection uh, library. There are different implementations for that, but let's take it for, for today as a given that you can compute such a set, uh, such an overlap in a privacy-preserving manner. And um, yeah, so that's um, again a summary of what is private set intersection. You have two um, data sets. They share some data points and you compute them in a privacy preserving manner, what's the intersection? Um, now the second, as a baseline, what we need for today is what is split neural network? And we've touched upon that quickly, but as mentioned, we'll uh, look into that uh, yeah, with more detail. And um, let's quickly talk about what's a split neural network. So say you have Alice and Bob, and, and they now want to, let's say, start federated learning on their data. And now instead of what you would do with classical horizontal federated learning, where you would pretty much take a global model and send it to each of the data sets, compute them, and then you get it back. Um, here with split neural network, you treat each um, data set as, an, as a self-contained neural network that feeds into the next segment. So you pretty much define a cut layer. That's the, let's say, uh, green, Alice's green layer. And this feeds as a self-contained neural network into uh, the next data set. And then when you do back propagation, you just feed that back. And so in the end, you end up with a technique where um, only, let's say, the entire value chain has the full neural network. And each of the participants in the end just has a self-contained neural network, but that just is a part 
part of, let's say, the entire um, neural network uh, that you're aiming to train. And um, benefits are, let's say, obvious again in the sense that companies don't have to share data. But um, what is interesting as well is that um, split neural networks really have on, let's say, some data sets and some use cases, um, a very high accuracy and a computational efficiency. Um, so that's as well a new technique that is coming up that is increasing um, as well the attention side um, on uh, in, in research. Um, we have Adam Hall as well um, that many of you know, um, yeah, who we as well collaborate and obviously he's um, part of Open Mind, a core uh, person there. And he's really an expert on split neural networks as well. Um, I think Pavlos as well has done some work on that. Um, so that's really a new, let's say, technique to um, federate uh, a machine learning model and it has some benefits. And um, so in the end, to simply just summarize what um, Pavlos now will give a deep dive uh, into the concrete use case. But when we, what we did at Pi Vertical is we took a data set and we distributed it in a vertical um, manner. So we created a vertically distributed data set. Um, and then uh, first of all, computed the intersection of this data set by a private set intersection. So you know pretty much on both data sets, what are the um, samples that are in both data sets. Then we ordered those such that they fit, let's say entry one here belongs to entry one and entry two belongs to entry two. And then we trained a split neural network on this data set. That's um, what Pi Vertical is all about and as such a practical um, yeah, example how to really do uh, vertically distributed federated learning. If you don't know what the other company has in terms of data and are not allowed to, to share it. And to make that concrete and really give you a crisp and as well hopefully motivate you to come and help us um, on the uh, public repo, Pavlis will now a give an insight into uh, what we've developed. Pavlis, up to you. Thank you, Robin. Thanks for the great explanation of all uh, the basic uh, concepts that uh, we have used. So, about the use case. Here we will see a high level, simple use case, and then we will jump into the code specifics using a Jupyter Notebook. You probably already know MNIST, which is a popular set of 100 digits alongside their labels. So this is our full data set, data set sorry, where we have the images and the labels. To make it vertically partitioned, we split the full data set into one data set of only images and one data set of only labels. Following, we assign IDs to each data point, we randomly shuffle each data set, and finally, we randomly remove some elements from each one. Next, using private set intersection, or PC, we can link data points using their unique IDs. We can filter data points that are elements of the intersection only, and we can reorder the data points using linked indices. Finally, we have the training process, where we send the images to the first part of the split network, send the labels to the second part of the split network, and train the split neural network. Now we will jump into the code. First of all, we will define the training only for five epochs. You can play with this notebook afterwards. And we will create two workers, Alice and Bob, where Alice will have a part of the network and the 100 images. And Bob will have the, another part of the network and the labels. Firstly, we define our split neural network class. This class takes a set of models and they link optimizers as input. Following, we import all the regular imports for training with PySift, all the imports for splitting the data set vertically, vertically and relinking it using PC, set up a torch hook and download the MNIST data set. Now, it's time to split the data set vertically, images and labels, and batch the data into our data loader. Here, 
let's first check if data is ordered or unordered. Basically, we're just using a simple Python matplot library to plot the images and the labels. As you can see here, the labels 4, 6, 6, 8, etc., are not corresponding to each image. 5, 0, 1, 7. So yes, the two data sets are unordered. So now let's implement PC to link these uh, data sets accordingly. This step will take a little while. We are using our own functions. And then I will come back to it later when it will finish. We have to check again if the data sets are now ordered. In the example that I ran before, you can see that the labels are corresponding to each image. 9, 4, 2, 4, etc. I hope it will finish in a little bit. So let's continue. We continue with the split neural network by defining the network which will be distributed. As Robin explained before, we are going for a simple uh, three-layered network, similar with the Open Mind Spy Shift folded split neural network tutorial by Adam. You can follow it for more information. Probably you are already familiar with uh, this procedure. Now that the PC has linked everything, you can see that each image again is corresponding to its label. Next, basically in the end here, we have created the Alice and Bob workers and defined the model locations where the model will be sent for training. Then we built the split neural network. All that is required for this to work is the, for the model segments to be in the starting locations and paired to their respective optimizers. Furthermore, we define our training function. The usage of split neural network is similar to a conventional model. You are, all, you are probably already familiar with uh, this procedure. Finally, we train our split neural, ne neural network. And if you remember on the top, we just define it for the training to be only for five epochs. This step will take a little while as well. And the final step of our code is uh, just to check if data is still vertically partitioned. From the example, you can see it in a little bit. You can see actually that the labels are pointing to Bob and the images are pointing to Alice. So everything is correct. We can continue with the presentation. But one potential question you might have, and it's normal, is who cares about a bunch of images and labels? Now imagine a real world scenario where two departments have private records of the same individual. The first department may have data such as name, telephone, address, marital status, dependents. And the second department may have data such as name, telephone, address, bank depth, mortgage installment, and more. These two departments, X and Y in our case, have partial information about the same individual but they cannot share their information without violating this person's privacy. This phenomenon of vertically distributed data sets is very common in electronic health records or EHR management too. Different departments may have specific data that are crucial for diagnosis or treatment, but again, they cannot simply merge their information. This healthcare scenario is exactly one of our big milestones that we are currently working on, and you can find more, more details in our GitHub repo at github.com slash openmind slash PyVertical. Feel free to join and contribute. If you find any bugs or issues, please create a new issue on GitHub and let us know. Thank you very much. So we've... we've... 30 minutes left, left, obviously, we've uh, run through the, the topic. Happy to do a deep dive. Um, yeah, so let us know if there are any questions.
No questions? Ah, there we go. Yeah, so um, I read out the question, not sure if everyone sees it. So um, the question is, are there any downsides of split neural networks with comparison to traditional federated learning approaches? Or better say, for which data sets is split neural network not suited? So I'll take that question and Pablo's please extend. Um, so in general, I would consider split neural networks, first of all, as a methodology. And then there are, let's say, different types of use cases for it. So for us, we have created this vertically um, distributed data set and then trained a split neural network. And um, as such, let's say, traditional horizontal federated machine learning in itself would not work for this use case because you, um, let's say, it, it almost seems obvious that if you have this vertically partitioned data set that you can really change here on the one hand is the labels and on the other uh, side is the features or as well on the one hand are some features and on the other side are some features and the labels and you really take this split neural network if you think about the graph it's uh, one part of the network on the first side and one part uh, on the second side so it almost feels as if um, let's say the split neural network here is the right approach and i think um, for such data sets at least horizontal classical horizontal federated um, machine learning frameworks do not uh, work. There are obviously others, um, for example, via MPC to train um, neural networks on vertically partitioned uh, data beyond split neural networks. Now, nevertheless, split neural networks cannot just only be used for vertically partitioned data, but split neural networks, again, is only a methodology to um, yeah, federate a uh, model training. And it can be as well used for classical horizontal federated learning. So let's take the example of you have just um, yeah, the same features at every place and um, just different samples. And then you can nevertheless yeah, send the first part of the entire network to the first um, data set, train there the self-contained neural network, and then feed that into the next one. Now for this, I would say there are definitely some downsides. Um, and in particular, let's say uh, two downsides that um, should be carefully looked at. That's on the one hand, let's say the privacy uh, guarantees. And um, then on the other hand, um, what's the entire, let's say practicability of uh, such a framework. Now for um, the privacy side, so first of all, one, one must say this is really um, a topic that is, um, at cutting research right now, so that's being investigated. I think um, Adam will um, publish a paper there soon. Publish, uh, let me know um, if that's already out, at least. Um, I think it's about to come out where, where he really looks um, uh, at the privacy constraints of split neural network. And so first of all, one must say um, the first practical downside, it's not as investigated uh, yet. And so um, one should be careful when it comes to um, privacy assessments. And just to give a feeling of what can go wrong there. Now, if you think about, um, let's say, this line of different, uh, let's say, networks feeding into the next one, you obviously get um, iteratively through for and back propagation um, information about the, let's say, layers, the layer output of the previous um, the, the previous uh, yeah, data set holder. And so you can start learning based on that um, about other companies' data sets. And so that's um, the, the privacy side of things. And now, um, if, again, out of practical, uh, so when you look from a, a few on practicality, now if you take the setup of, let's say, millions of distributed mobile phones, now, um, feeding those in order uh, via a split neural network training obviously becomes very cumbersome and um, as well maybe difficult to manage and organize because you really have to make sure that kind of like the back propagation is um, hold consistent. Now, various with practical horizontal federated learning in a mobile phone setting, what you would do is um, kind of like create batches in itself, right? You would send out all your untrained or your current global model and then you receive some back you maybe average them in a bucket so you have far more flexibility on the engineering side to um let's say organize that 
Um, so in particular for mobile phones, I would say um, it's really not uh, practical just from a setup perspective, or I would say not practical yet, because what we see is the type of how you train split neural networks across different distributions. This is well an active field of research. So there's a, there, there might be a lot of change uh, to it, but it's um, not as mature. Um, so yeah, that, that would be my, uh, yeah, my comparison really from a real world implementation perspective, what is practical or not. Um, not sure, Paulus, if there's anything you would like to add from an algorithmic or research side, but that would be my assessment. Yes, basically it depends on how big is the data set as well, because uh, as we could see that split and end perform better and are more efficient uh, over a large number of uh, clients or more. And um, yeah, what we presented, it's actually the f probably the first open source uh, implementation of split neural networks on vertically partitioned data. In the future, we plan to investigate all the different flavors and techniques and methodologies to improve it. So we have a concrete uh, um, solution about that. Yeah, I can totally stress on that. I think um, it's, it's really, it's starting um, and, and changing a lot um, how, let's say, people can think and relate to federated learning. And definitely with, let's say, the start of PyVertical, we'll plan to extend. And then here again, um, please get active and help us. I think um, there's, let's say, a lot to work on and just reach out to me or Pavlos and we can guide you on, um, yeah, what, what can be worked on together. And that as well counts as in general, I think we as well appears consider ourselves as a strong partner of Open Mind. So if there's anything you want to discuss about or talk about or collaborate on, just reach out. We're both on Open Mind Slack, obviously. Um, so yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Are companies already aware of the hidden value of vertically distributed data points they might not have? Or do you guys have to push them to realize it? Wonderful question. And um, to me, as let's say, um, as an entrepreneur, a, a thing that um, obviously is at the top of my mind um, every day. I think um, we see that federated learning in the community is um, more and more, and more and more, let's say, people are aware of the concept of federated learning. And I think those that start to look into those topics as well quickly realize the downsides of it. And that has mostly to do with, um, Andrew sometimes calls that the difference between dynamic and static federated learning. That's the very simple case, the first, let's say, article of Google that assumes that data is already there. You know how it looks like, you know what to do with it. And so federated learning is just the technique to federate the training for um, to, to fit the model. So that's the model fitting part. Now, from a data science perspective, if you start to do data science on not directly accessible data, on distributed data of third parties, um, obviously the model fitting part from a data science workflow is just a small step in the entire data science workflow. But what is far more to it is how is data being distributed? Um, what, yeah. What's, what are the different distributions? Is the data set up? Do I know about the relational scheme? Is it aligned? Do I have to normalize it? Um, so all these uh, questions um, have to be answered before we can start the model fitting. And I think what we see in the market is that people know about federated learning and know um, and, and often either do not really intuitively understand what the downsides are. And once they start looking at it and trying to use it themselves, they realize, okay, it's not practical, but not from a federated learning perspective, but from a data science on distributed data perspective. There it's, um, there, let's say, come the downsides and difficulties. And um, yeah, so that's, that would be my feeling on, what, on what's the, uh, the stage um, of the market. And now we as a company, we definitely educate a lot. And um, I think that starts in particular educating people on the business side of things. So often you see the, let's say, data scientists having an understanding about federated learning. But if you look at budgets within um, organizations, they typically come from the business side and as well the concrete business value have to be identified. And so from a, let's say, sales perspective, it very much makes sense to give the business side the idea of what further 
data sets, organizations with data can I start collaborating on? And there, it's a lot of education in particular of how does the setup have to be that a data collaboration makes sense? And that's um, on the one hand, how is, how is the data distribution and really breaking that down? Um, that's one of the tasks that we consider as very important. But then as well, what's the type of business models that I want to apply and build upon um, such a new data collaboration? And um, there's as well, let's say not many frameworks exist um, to, to organize that. And obviously there's not just um, the, let's say, classical collaborative mode where just in the end the global trained model um, goes to one party but you can distribute the value that is being generated um, according to any principles that you want and you can as well support that by legal frameworks so data use agreements or actual contracts um, that that support such uh, data driven business models um, yeah that would be my assessment on um, market availability happy to as well give more insights into concrete sectors or anything if you like, I think there's as well a big sector uh, difference. Any other, yeah. Can you give us an example how you guys pack the shown approach into services which you offer to customers as of today? Um, sure. So uh, let's say the, the portion of vertically distributed federated learning is um, something that um, is we only apply in terms of professional services yet from a theorist. So um, let's say that is being productized, um, but as you see, it's really just the starting point. And in general, we believe from a theorist that um, let's say the core primitives of any um, collaboration must be open source to create trust and as well to drive adoption. And so um, we really consider, let's say, our proprietary um, work here, just the interface to the customer, um, but not, let's say, the core underlying principles. And so I think in general, what we see is that for privacy preserving record linkage, um, as a technique, there is not a full robust um, solution applicable yet, but that is uh, changing. And I think the speed of change is really um, yeah, impressive across different, let's say, cryptographic primitives. And now what we've done here is um, using, obviously, private set section and split neural networks as a combination. And in general, uh, we as well, from a theorist, use such, let's say, cryptographic primitive and then as a second step, um, a let's say federated computation um, in in services uh, to customers directly right now. So basically, we have a product that is built upon the idea of federated or remote execution of compute um, or federated computations. So that's basically an engineering framework to distribute computations, and then um, the type of computations that you launch in a remote setting must be privacy preserving. And then that's pretty much the, let's say, product um, part of our uh, work. And then we um, level that up with services of how do you actually measure privacy as well when it comes to different type of computations and give assessments there. And I think um, when we see of what is available from the research side, there's a big gap to um, what is A, of interest and be as well robust to be integrated in uh, real world applications. And so right now there's still definitely a, a big services component where we really look at uh, problems and uh, work on that together with customers and productizing that on the go when we learn about that. That's how we treat it. Any other questions? If not, or did we receive anything on Slack? I think um, if, uh, absolutely, Emma, please uh, ask a question. Okay, cool. 
so the question that I have is how much do you think it will take for privacy preserving machine learning to be fully used in like, for example, uh, machine learning projects and do out of business out of it? I mean, how much time do you give it? And that's a wonderful and um, almost impossible to answer uh, type of question. I think we see privacy preserving machine learning fabricated and privacy preserving machine learning being used in production. We are in production, um, in particular in, let's say, the life science uh, field. We are um, in production with multiple customers. So we see it is a topic that is not just a research field, but we do as well see that it's still an active area of research. And I think um, my perception is that um, the real big gap is won't be the cryptographic primitives or the, let's say, underlying privacy preserving technologies. And I'm not saying that those are all at the point where you can fully, let's say, leverage them and there shouldn't be more research. On the contrary, there should be far more research. But compared to what we see in academia and in research happen, how various and diverse the frameworks are to what is actually being implemented, there's a huge gap. And I think the core um, thing that needs to be solved um, in order to close that gap is really supporting the entire data science workflow uh, when it comes to analyzing data of third parties. And that starts by, first of all, looking what type of analytics are actually of interest. And that's obviously sometimes machine learning frameworks, but as well, um, let's say classical queries. And there are companies that only focus on one thing but I think we really start to need to think in what type of different frameworks can we use and build connectors to such that a data scientist does not, does not have to use a new tool for federated learning, but rather can live in his own typical data science workflow as he's used to and thereby, thereby have all the tools available and nevertheless have some frameworks that allow to assess and build that up in a privacy-preserving manner. And so this entire data science on, not distribu uh, on distributed data workflow that is more than model fitting, that's, I would say, the, the biggest um, bottleneck there. And I think um, Andrew would be 100% aligned to uh, this assessment and as well, where we see that OpenMind um, is more and more developing in that uh, direction and as well, um, the let's say, first real product um, of, of well, let's say, easy to deploy uh, product um, of Duet, which is kind of like connect to Jupyter Notebooks in a privacy preserving manner. I think this is, all, this is already really going in that direction because it's for the data scientists that now can see remote data on um, not directly accessible data and then simplify what he would do with his own data available. And so I think we, we as, an, as a community really need to push in this entire direction. And that is as well, let's say an outreach to everyone who's active on open mind. Um, yeah, please, please really start to think about what does it mean for the data scientist if he now would actually be in the situation of wanting to analyze data that is not directly accessible. Because what we often see in academia is you now want to, let's say, write a paper that contains federated machine learning. So you take your central data set distribute it and then think about how to analyze that in a distributed setting. But that's not what we have. That's not what the market shows because you don't have the central data set to begin with where you do your tests and then you just show that it's well works distributed. But rather you don't know what the other company or organization has. Um, you maybe just know some information. So really start to think about what type of information do I need such that I can start my um, analysis. Maybe there's pre-analysis in a privacy preserving manner to get this information. And so this is pretty much the push that I would say um, is transformative and will change um, the way we think about computations and think about data science. And my feeling is that that will take some years to really, uh, for the, the point that you as a data scientist don't even realize that you are now not working on directly accessible data, but on distributed data. I think this will take some years, but um, I'm pretty sure we'll get there. And in maybe 10 years from now, no data scientists, maybe even questions whether data is directly accessible. And I think with big data, that as well makes sense because you, you, you never look at your entire data set. So it, it is so 
natural that you don't need it directly accessible. But let's say tools and frameworks are not there yet. Yeah. So, Loli, thank you very much. Sure. Cool. If there are no other questions, I at least don't see. Uh, Obi, might be a bit off topic, but how hard is it to hire talent for your company since you guys focus on a niche AI field? Wonderful question. Um, so, and hiring uh, is at the top of our, uh, of our mind in particular because we just raised a super successful uh, financing round. We now, let's say, world class investors uh, back this company. Um, some as well, very known, for example, Patrick Pichette, um, ex CFO of Google, chairman of Twitter, has invested into us. Ross Mason, the founder of Moolsoft, um, sold for $8 billion to Salesforce. So there's, let's say, a, a lot of traction. And so obviously, the question for talent um, uh, gets yeah, more prominent. I think what we always started with, and um, looking at where Pavlos is currently sitting, who is only working part time, but nevertheless um, part of part of a furious, obviously. And Pavlos is in Edinburgh. Uh, I'm in Berlin, so we are a remote possible company. We have our headquarters in Berlin, but we really mean remote possible in the sense that we create our structures that you can work remotely, and that obviously changes um, the availability. And in particular for, let's say, those niche roles where you say, okay, you need a dedicated specialist. Um, we, we live this remote possible as well to the extreme that um, I have seen some employees of affairs. I, I haven't seen them in real life yet. And nevertheless, we obviously communicate all the time via Zoom. Um, so I think that is making it easy, um, this remote possible idea, and as well, um, let's say, the traction that we received over the last um, six months. So we have um, yeah, almost hundreds of applications each, each week for various roles and for um, privacy. Obviously, OpenMind is a channel that is um, superb to receive inbound. And um, then I think the second question is, um, how do you manage a remote organization? How do you make sure that people can collaborate. And um, I think that is kind of like the topic that we have from a product. How do you incentivize companies to collaborate on data and as well collaborate um, is as well obviously something that we harness inside. How do we collaborate? What type of process and structures do you need? And, um, and, and I think this, let's say, entire push that you see in this given world that more and more things are digital, this conference being part of it, obviously, let's say, um, open mind in itself, most likely this conference would be digital um, independent of, um, let's say, the happenings in this world, but other conferences are not, and that makes it easier. Um, so in that sense, we don't have any difficulties right now, um, but how to assess how that scales. And then on the other, on the other side, I would say, as, as mentioned before, we don't see the competitive edge. Um, in the cryptographic primitive slash, we believe it is a necessity that it becomes open source. And so um, we really try to collaborate and um, give back as well and contribute um, uh, on many sides, but as well benefit um, from that. And so let's say the number of world-class researchers in the field of cryptography and privacy preserving AI um, might nothing that really has to scale uh, when you're trying to build an organization in this field and that as well to all entrepreneurs out there as a motivation um, i think uh, this world really gives you the chance to build upon communities to collaborate with uh, different people and we as well as a company collaborate um, with with many young startups and we really don't think in competition i think that's something the venture capital scene is trying to impose um, but um, often it's uh, it's not the field you really have to be in similar markets if you are a early stage startup to actually fear about the competition because the challenges that you face are so much greater than uh, someone let's say stealing or learning from your ideas um, I, I think uh, so in that sense um, as a motivation as well and if you want to test that reach out if there's overlap um, we, are, we are collaborating and uh, we, we believe that that makes a difference and I think um, open mind as well drives this um, yeah this this agenda and this mindset, uh, which is why we love to be part of it. Cool. Cool. Then thank you. Thank you so much for the session. It was great fun. And Emil, thanks for uh, organizing. Pavlos, good thank to be here much. with you. And um, yeah, looking forward to 
further collaboration with all of you out there. Out there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you everyone for, jo for joining the, the, this session. Very instructive and hope to see you soon. Bye-bye. Wonderful. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.